Good afternoon um, to all of you uh, with us in the room today at the International River Symposium uh, in Vienna. And uh, hello also to the 500 people that registered uh, online uh, from around 50 countries, which is uh, truly amazing. Um, and I welcome you to the first free flow webinar organized by the World Fish Migration Foundation and uh, Wetlands International on behalf of the Dam Removal Europe Coalition. Uh, my name is Frank and I will guide you through this session today, um, which we hope will be engaging and inspiring to you. Um, and we know these sessions in the afternoon after lunch can be a bit tiring, so we'll try to make it as dynamic as we can. Um, and I'm supported today by uh, my dear colleagues Neja Pozniak, the Free Flow Project Manager in the back, and uh, our director Hermann Wanningen here in the front, who will also act as the, the chat manager. So uh, yeah, throughout, like, throughout the symposium, you can use Slido to put any comments or questions. Um, we also have a short poll later. Um, so you can participate there just by scanning the QR code. You know the drill by now. And for those of you joining online, there should be uh, on the right side, like a, a Slido window, uh, window um, next to the stream video. Um, so for, like, after the official, uh, official opening, we will take like a global view um, on the last free-flowing rivers and their importance to the local communities, after which we will then zoom into Europe and hear from a wide array of practitioners um, that work tirelessly on, on protecting and restoring um, these precious rivers from Sweden through the Netherlands to the Balkans. Um, and then in the end we'll, we'll have a, a short Q&A and we'll get a, um, a sneak peek into our newly released um, documentary Dambusters. Um, so, so yeah, there's a lot of exciting stuff coming up um, and you can also find the link to the whole program um, in the Slido chat box as well. Um, just for some housekeeping, there will be a 20 minute coffee break at around 3.15 um, and we have to leave the room uh, by 10 past 5. Um, so dear speakers, already I alert you, please let's stick to the time. Um, we have a lot of, uh, we have a charge program so, uh, so everyone can get their say. Um, and that's it from me for now. So I'm very pleased to, to give over to Hermann Wanningen to officially open this session um, together with uh, Christa Grossart from the Dutch Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management. Please enjoy. Yeah, wel <coughs> welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Herman Wanningen from the Netherlands. I'm the director of the World Fish Migration Foundation and with us today is Christa. Christa Grossart, is she around? Yeah. Krista, Digitally. Hello. Krista, hello. Are, you, are you there? All right. Oh, I'm very big on the screen, I see. <laughs> yes, you. <laughs> in real life, you're smaller. But uh, yeah. thank you for being with us, Krista. I'm looking into the camera, I'm looking into you, actually. And can you tell a little bit more about yourself and what you're doing uh, in the Netherlands and, and why you love rivers and, 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 and what's, what's your background? Well, I'm Christa Grossart, as I said, uh, and I'm the, also the chair uh, of the expert group FIS of the ECBR. That's the International Committee of uh, Protection of the Rhine. Uh, and in the past, I've done a lot of work on the toxicity of chemicals uh, to aquatic organisms. And in my spare time, I like to be outside in nature and occasionally participate in aquatic biology monitoring to see which species are present in my own environment. And um, I love the dynamics of rivers, their power and the perpetual flow. It never stops and it, it is essential for us humans, but it's also essential for the migration of other species. Okay, thank you, Krista. Uh, and uh, why do you think that's important that rivers should uh, flow freely and, and, and what is your ministry doing about that? Now, free flowing rivers are important um, for fish migration where possible. And in the Netherlands, we have now regularly opened uh, the Haring Fitch Loises so that fish can migrate uh, by this route. Uh, Rijs Waterstaat, an agency of the Ministry of Infrastructure and Environment, closely monitors the salinity in the Haring Fleet um, so, uh, because that's important for agriculture, that it doesn't come to, to saline. Uh, at the uh, IJsselmeer and the Afsluitdijk, there's also a project to create a fish migration river. And the practical management uh, of our regional smaller waters, streams, are the responsibility of several separ separate water boards with their own management. 
in general, uh, these water managers aim to make water as natural as possible. Of course, water safety and other functions of the water have to be taken into account. But in practice, nature-based solutions help to achieve all goals. Thank you, Krista. That Krista, did you want to say any, anything else? But I, I, I thought you were... No. no? <laughs> I have a next yeah. question for you. And uh, it's a bit about dam, removing dams, also free-flowing rivers. And I know that you are part of the International Rhine Committee. Uh, is this topic being addressed on the, in, the, in the International Rhine Committee? And what kind of role does, does this committee play? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, fish migration is prominently on the agenda of the International Commission for the Protection of the Rhine, but all the aspects must also be taken into account. So it does not have by definition. So it doesn't mean by definition that all rivers can also become free flowing. Uh, but where there are opportunities, this is taken into account. And bottlenecks for fish migration are especially on the agenda of the expert group fish. Um, with the aim that the uh, rep representative species, the salmon, but that is not only the salmon, of course, it is a, a, a representative for other fish, uh, the salmon can reach Switzerland again. And that's our goal. So that's that's the goal, to reach Switzerland from the sea to the source, so from the Netherlands yeah. to Switzerland. That's a beautiful topic. Yeah, for the salmon, topic. yeah. I, I hope it will happen uh, before 2030, uh, because we have this like international target of 25,000 kilometers of free-flowing river, but let's let's make it happen. And uh, I want to thank you for being here. But just to do the official part, can you say the official words? Uh, I offer. Uh, I declare this webinar officially open. So I hope you have a, a good uh, webinar, and we can learn a lot from each other. Thank you. Thanks, Krista. Uh, Frank, you're. Thank you so much, uh, Christian Hermann. And uh, now, next, we will get to travel the world with uh, Sui Chiang and Joshua Royd from the Nature Conservancy, who will tell us more about um, the importance of free flowing rivers for their local communities and how these different contexts that they are situated in also call for um, very diverse conservation approaches. So, Sui, Josh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Sui, so you're ready to start in, I will share the screen. Thank you so much, George. Uh, the host needs to enable my screen sharing. Uh, maybe you can start in introducing yourself. Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, you know, first of all, thank you so much to um, the World Fish Migration Foundation and, you know, to the organizers uh, for giving us this opportunity uh, to present. Uh, unfortunately, you know, Josh and myself are not uh, in person, but uh, hopefully, you know, we're representing, um, you know, the, the audience outside of, of the symposium itself. Uh, my name is Sue. I am the uh, freshwater fisheries conservation scientist uh, at the Nature Conservancy. And today I'll be, you know, co-sharing this presentation uh, with, with Josh, uh, um, uh, Josh Roy. Who you know you you can introduce yourself, Josh. Yeah, I'll introduce. I'm senior scientist for the Nature Conservancy here in Maine, but I also help with the Europe. Thanks, fantastic. Um, yeah, so uh, you know, I said you would just want to give an overview of maybe some of the you know the challenges of freshwater conservation uh, outside of Europe. You know, to give that sort of global perspective, and so and so the way that we're gonna. Uh, and go about this presentation is first, you know, we'll, we'll touch on maybe some of the important aspects of river conservation um, that we're seeing. And then we're going to dive across this global sort of travel between um, Asia, North America, Latin America and Africa, just to show you the, some of the different case studies uh, of river conservation that TNC is involved with, you know, and, you know, interspersed without that, um, the case studies are some going to be some sort of freshwater uh, conservation lessons on that. So, you know, the way that I see rivers is, you know, as as much as, as beautiful as they are, we live in a world where there is a uh, human uh, need, right? And so, but the way that I think about it is that rivers, you know, underpin these, you know, key in, uh, services um, for all of us, right? So we've got no poverty, uh, so we think about all the livelihood uh, 
benefits that are generated off you know both the freshwater ecosystem as also its natural resources the amount of food uh, and inland fisheries provided uh, and contribute to zero hunger water with clean water and sanitation and the important role of you know of floodplains and, and peatlands and wetlands for climate change action and just think about just the natural biodiversity uh, of inland uh, systems you know my favorite fact as a fishery scientist is that half of all fishes around the world you know species that are inclusive marine are actually found in fresh water so that's half of all fish species uh, just in those rivers and lakes around the world Fantastic, Sri. Thank you. And and I think a lot of us have seen this slide before. It's something that the World Fish Migration Foundation and others have <clears throat> shown from the uh, the Global Index that we're in trouble. We know this that uh, species have been lost since 1970. This is an incredible loss in my own lifetime. Maybe some of yours as well. Um, and it's not just for fish, as Sri said. It's 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 for these. In- incredibly connected ecosystems that include multiple species from insects and mosses and underwater uh, mussels and clams to species over and around and, and even in the terrestrial ecosystems around them and the peoples that evolved in these ecosystems as well as the current communities that live in these places and thrive on them and need these commercial fisheries that depend on uh, these river bound fish. I often show this slide, which is just a great indication of where the world's biodiversity is, where there are currently dams in little blue dots, and the dark green biodiversity area, you'll notice red and orange dots. Those are dams planned or under construction already. So these are places um, where those boxes are, and we'll also show the Penobscot, um, where there's a lot of people depending on these fisheries. So who are we? We're the Nature Conservancy, um, and our mission is to conserve the land and waters where all life uh, well, all love depends on. And you can see where we work around the world, where we touch the ground. Um, it's expanding um, every few years. We add new offices. Um, we have a lot of members, as you can see, over a million around the world. We have eight, uh, $1.8 billion total revenue and support. But most importantly, I think, is our, our projects, our conservation projects for land protection, marine protection, and reconnecting and protecting rivers. So these are the major strategies that we employ um, in order to figure out how we're going to restore connectivity in rivers from assessing where the barriers are and the, and the habitat data so we can marry those two data sources together, tools to help us prioritize among those because it's too much to take in all at once, and funding mechanisms, which are getting better. We'll show some examples of that and policies as well, and education and outreach because if we don't inspire people, if we don't educate people how to do these projects, how to manage a project, how to inspire other people, then we're really not going to make any action with this. And we need to implement and monitor, and that has a feedback loop. So we can talk about some of the work the Conservancy is doing, but I wanted to flash this up on the screen as well, is all the places, uh, an indicator of all the places where people are working on behalf of these rivers, whether it's protection or restoration or education, um, or just learning about these species academics. So the World Fish Migration Foundation every two years holds this event, and there's over 10,000 people that help bring this together. And now the case studies, I'm gonna start with China. So an amazingly large country, and the Yangtze River Basin is one of the largest basins in this country. And you can see on this map some highlighted um, fish reserve areas. And I'm going to focus in the middle where we have the Xishui River Basin. Um, and it's fantastic for many reasons. One, it's got a lot of the biodiversity that occurs in the main stem Yangtze that may be threatened or fragmented by dams. And it's much less dams. It's long. 437 kilometers long. It's got over a third of the Yanks' endemic and rare fish. Um, so that's a nice place to do representation if you're going to have a restoration and protection site. So what's helpful here is that there's been a series of legislative moves by the, the Chinese government to protect the Yangtze River, including this um, Great Protection of the Yangtze River National Strategy, the work plans developed from it, an action plan, and actually law now. So how this plays out on the ground is pretty exciting. Once we look at, uh, uh, it enables funding for studies to be done on the habitat, the water quality, which are both really good, and also to look at those rare and endemic species. Those populations are also really good. It doesn't mean that they're not threatened at all. There is fishing pressure. There's agricultural inputs. But as you look at this basin flowing to the top of the screen, most of those impacts are in the lower part of the river. So the Nature Conservancy does a lot of connectivity analysis. And this is where we look at where the barriers are and what, what 
distance of streams, how many kilometers link in between those free flowing sections. And for most of this river, you can see this dark blue. There's a lot of great connectivity, but you can see that lower section of the basin where they are much more fragmented, lots of little dams. And so the plan for the upper Yangtze includes, this is astounding, over 3,500 dam removals uh, to, to really get at ecological priorities for these fish to compensate in part for the fragmentation in other parts of the watershed. A really neat plan to really focus on those areas that have the highest biodiversity value. Over 1,100 of these are already in nature reserves, so that's a great place to start. And an immediate focus will be in the Shishue Basin that I just highlighted. And what that includes our 17 small hydropower dams that were already removed by 2020, 30 dams in the Sichuan section of the basin, and then Guizhou section, there's another 100 small hydropower dams that are due to be removed. So really exciting work in China, but it's not without challenges. Even though you have um, um, government rules and laws, you still need to get local buy-in. And that's a problem we have all over the world with these projects. We need buy-in. We need education. We want people to appreciate the values that Shui mentioned that you can bet that will uh, come to these local cultures as you free up their rivers and make them healthier. There's also problems dealing with the waste around disposal. It's happening kind of quick. There aren't really guidelines and coordination that I think a lot of people would like all over the world so that different agencies work with one another to make these projects more smooth. So now I'm going to jump halfway around the world, pretty much, to the um, the United States, where there is the state of Maine and the Penobscot Basin, which many of you have heard about so many times. If you haven't, you're probably living under the ocean or something. But uh, I was asked to present on this real quickly. So it is about the same size, you'll notice, slightly larger than the Shishue Basin. It drains most of Maine. It's mostly forested. And um, from about 1830 until 2013, when we began uh, the second dam removal, only 4% of the entire watershed was accessible for sea and fish. And this is the section of the watershed where the barriers are. Here's just a quick glance of our 12 sea run fish. People are really excited about Atlantic salmon, but there's two species of uh, river herring, other elocids, sea lamprey, and eel. So it's a fantastic project. All these species still occurred in, the, in this river. So it, this project involves improving fish passage at all the dams that are marked with little blue bubbles on the right. Uh, and fish passage and energy upgrades on all the green bubbles on the left. So <clears throat> you'll notice the two lowest dams on the river at about 60 kilometers up from the river will be removed, 60 and 75 kilometers up from the river. So this is going to restore 3,200 kilometers of habitat. And what it took to get here was, one, federal tribal recognition so that the Penobscot Nation had a say in the permitting process, the Federal Dams Act, which meant that environmental considerations had to be brought in. It took partners. It took a bruising defeat of a dam that was proposed for the power company to say, well, we may be out of pay, pay attention to folks. And then we can look also at the power of relationships building with the dam owners, with the managers. And that was crucial for this project to go through. Just a quick look at what these look like, the Great Works Dam Removal. The opening ceremony, ceremony with our Secretary of the Interior present. There's before, there's after with a beautiful free-flowing rapid that's a little tricky. I did spill a canoe in that rapid once. The Howland Fish Bypass upstream where the dam couldn't be removed, but we built this nature-like fishway, beautiful fishway around it. It's got 100% efficiency for fish passage. And the energy before and after um, shows that you can actually gain energy by increasing the efficiency at dams. But note here on the left, 18.1 megawatts. 18.1 megawatts there now, that's the capacity of these three dams that were taken out to block 65% of the river access for just that amount of megawatts. There are now turbines off the coast of Denmark producing firm four megawatts each as far as their capacity. So the benefits, I won't go through all of them, but you're welcome to contact me later for them. But most exciting, I think, is going from zero fish to maybe a few hundred up to 3.4 million fish this past year. Um, it's increased revenues uh, when we do fish uh, restoration for local communities. The lobster industry uh, depends on these fish for bait in the springtime, and we're hoping to see increases in the ground fish. And it's a healthier food source for local communities. There's connections where all these dams were parks. So we've gone from some access 
to a whole bunch of access, not the whole watershed, but we're doing pretty good, about 66%, 3,200 kilometers. But it's not just about the big dams, of course. It's also about all these little culverts that block access to headwaters. And so in summary for the Penobscot, we did a bunch of planning and science to figure out where barriers are, figure out where habitat are, assess the flood risk. And we also looked at policy mechanisms to make this work more easy than putting in a bad culvert or, or installing a new dam. And we also worked uh, in Washington, D.C. on getting federal funding mechanisms. We worked at state funding mechanisms. We've done incredible outreach in communities up and down the state with these stream smart classes, incentive programs for engineers, alternative energy financing for like wind power and and uh, solar power for small towns in the area that are losing dams. And we're also doing implementation, of course, uh, all around the watershed as shown by all these different graphics. So that's it for the Penobscot. And now on to Africa, Shui. I think you've got something to say here. Just uh, shout when I can move my slides ahead. Thanks. Thank you, Josh. Um, yeah, so we're going to jump over to uh, Africa now. So just a sort of a just jumping across, <laughs> again, all these continents. So we're going to go to the Okavango River Basin, which sort of covers Angola, Namibia, and Botswana. If you go to the next slide, Josh. So the Okavango Basin, you know, it floods annually. It's sort of a very different system. It, 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 it generates these huge floods um, that, that, that then go through a dry season. It covers you roughly 170,000 kilometers, and it's, you know, key habitat for terrestrial biodiversity so we're talking about you know those enig enigmatic sort of african species that you think about um elephants uh, hippos crocodiles you know the dark Rango basin is, is a key sort of terrestrial habitat but it's also important sort of for aquatic biodiversity and especially if you think about that regionally that area maybe doesn't have as much water as other areas uh, on the continent but the area is, um, you know, and this one, we put this in to highlight that at the moment, the Okavango is relatively free-flowing, right? But there are other threats. So within the context of this presentation, you know, and this sort of um, session, we talk about restoring free-flowing. But there are other rivers out there, sort of key rivers, that we need to sort of um, prevent uh, other challenges and, and threats. So it, it, specific for Angola, you talk about the recent civil war, you know, that just ended in, in I think, you know, 2002. And the area has, you know, is still dealing with that, um, with that uh, legacy. It's also quite a remote region with little infrastructure and investment. Uh, the capital, Luanda, is quite far up north. They are talking about proposed hydropower in there, but the sort of the... Um, this uh the returns are, and you know the distance towards the um the the urban centers you know are, are questions that still remain there's deforestation going on there's uncertainty in tenure and rights and there's also fishing pressure as well where there's not a lot of different livelihoods for local communities and so there's fishing pressure there so we're going to sort of what are the sort of activities that tnc are doing you know with local partners uh in this area is we partner with communities to organize themselves as sort of fishery co-ops and fishery co-ops are the legal mechanisms that Angola uses to uh, provide rights and, and tenures for fishing for communities to uh, aquatic resources. So we work with the local uh, legal system and, and, and its setups to sort of give that voice to the to the local communities who rely on the Okamango. And then from there, we work through multi-stakeholder commissions where we integrate those co-ops within the government structure to give them that representation uh, and sort of decision-making uh, in, in, in resources. Um, and then we also work on that local scale. So we design and we work with the fishery co-ops to sort of think about their fishery management activities. And that is not only to think about uh, reducing the fishing pressure, but to think about how to maximize that return of that of the fishing that they are doing. So that's addressing sort of post-harvest waste, maybe identifying other sort of um, products that they can um, they can get value from uh, with from their fishing. And we're thinking about these different alternative livelihoods. Maybe if we can uh, remove some of that fishing pressure, return uh, to more conservation, and maybe move providing different sources of income on there. Um, and then, you know, it's very hard to talk about rivers around the world if you don't talk about the Amazon. And, you know, we're quite lucky that the that TNC is able to work in parts of the Amazon. 
Um, and if you go to the next um, slide, um, so primarily there's the Amazon River Basin. Um, you know, I think we all know about the Amazon. It's a huge, um, you know, uh, key river system, both sort of uh, for the global climate um, agenda as well. And I was very lucky to, to visit there this year. So if you go to the next slide, um, yeah, that one. So at the moment, I'll be talking about one of the areas that we work with, and it's a Cacadet River in, in Colombia. This is the Andean portion of the uh, of the Amazon. Uh, and I should also put in there, there's, there's a neighboring river, uh, Andean River, uh, called the, the Napa River, which is in the um, uh, Ecuadorian side of the Andes, um, that we do similar projects uh, and similar approaches in there. But in the Cacatá, it covers Colombia, Brazil, and, and again, there's these annual floods that come through. Um, we are very important. Um, the that you know the Kakita River Basin covers 78% of the Colombian Amazon uh, area. So it's very key for if you think about not just the river and, and, the, and the freshwater resources, but also that terrestrial environment as well. Uh, and I one of the one of the biggest sort of uh, um, I would say opportunities is that in Latin America, the indigenous territories are, are, are a much more recognized um um opportunity than maybe in Africa. And so Specifically in the Kakata River, uh, these in indigenous territories, you know, you know covering more than 40% of the basin. And then so similar to that, um, to the um, so to the Okavango, we get these different sort of multifaceted challenges. We've got again fossil fuel extraction with oil and gas. There's some uh, gold mining that's going on that leaches out mercury, which then sort of pollutes the river and the fish. And then then we're looking at interactions with human health. The sort of agriculture and cattle ranching, which is sort of a, a, a common theme throughout the Amazon. We talk about climate change impacts on changes in precip. And also there's aquaculture and unsustainable fishing, which maybe we see as more direct impacts on that fish biodiversity and freshwater ecosystem. We can go to the next slide. So we're adopting a similar approach, with that, which is that community-based conservation approach where we work with the communities and especially with their legal tenure to, to you know, both the river and sort of the river basin um, to design sort of conservation and management of protected areas. Um, again, we work with sort of partnering with these communities to increase um, their, their representation in government decisions. Uh, and also again, looking at different alternative livelihoods. So that picture on the left actually is from that Napo River in Ecuador that I talked about. It's a the community called Senangoy, and they successfully lobbied against um, oil and gas exploration within the territory, you know, through the argument of, of FPIC, um, which is a, a great win. And if you think about that, it's not a freshwater conservation argument about removing oil and gas, but maybe a more, uh, free and prior informed consent approach. You know, there's these ideas that we can think about uh, of protecting freshwater ecosystems, ecosystems which are maybe, maybe non-traditional, non-conventional. Um, and then I was going to put in the, the potential slides. You know, I don't know how many of you were able to watch the documentary yesterday. So TNC has made this documentary about the Amazon catfish and sort of the work that we're doing there with communities, linking communities, biodiversity, and that fresh water. And I'll ask sort of uh, Dominica if she could share it in the chat, but there's a YouTube uh, link and it'll be, you know, it, it's a opportunity to see some of the work that we're doing there. Um, next slide. So summary, sort of, you know, we think about freshwater conservation, we've got to think about the, the key habitats, both for fish and both for uh, other biodiversity. You know, we use that to underpin some of these information and decision making. You know, globally, you know, we look at the differences that Josh talked about. We've got dams much more in, in, in China and, and North America, but there are other threats that are going on as well to the, our freshwater ecosystems that go beyond sort of dam removal and, and restoring freshwater ecosystems. Um, you know, highlighting, re, re emphasizing what Josh said is that these conservation, you know, have to be socially and culturally and sort of politically aware of what's going on in the region, because I think that provides the opportunities as well as. Uh, challenges uh, for doing conservation. You know, these freshwater ecosystems, you have to approach them through multi-stakeholder approaches. And then just to emphasize that local communities, you know, we find are often most impacted by, by freshwater decisions, whether that's dams or, or, or 
uh, other uh, impacts on freshwater rivers. But then they're, 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 they are important stewards um, that we should work with uh, in terms of moving forward with freshwater restoration. Thank you very much. You know, I we hope that we we kept the time. Uh, you know, just want to reiterate. You know, thank you for the opportunity for for presenting. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you both of you for this uh, quick and very educational trip around the world. I don't know, Neza, do we have time for a question or are we? Uh... No. Okay. I'm so sorry, guys. We have to move on. <laughs> have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, and as promised before, we'll now uh, come back to Europe. And uh, what better way to kick off this segment than by visiting one of the last remaining free-flowing river landscapes in Europe, um, the pristine Balkans. And what better person to, to take us there than Ulrich Eichmann, um, CEO, of, CEO of Riverwatch, who has been active in this space for decades. Welcome, Uli. Could you tell us a bit more about what makes that region so extraordinary? Yeah, thanks for, for having me. Can you start the... Presentation. Yeah, as I said, I'm uh, Ulrich Eichelmann, um, head of the NGO Riverwatch. We're based in Vienna. Um, I worked also for all my, my professional life on protection of rivers. I was in Brazil, in Asia. But in the last 10 years, I'm focusing together with colleagues from uh, Germany, uh, Euronatur, and many others uh, on the Balkans on protecting the rivers there. And I want to lead you quickly through that. Uh, what is at stake and what we do in order to save them. So this is a map of the Balkan rivers. Uh, you see the big blue line, that's the Danube. And you see the different colors represent different uh, river basins. And you see all the rivers that go into the Adriatic Sea are rather small uh, and short, but extremely diverse, extremely diverse. We're, we're, when we say uh, Balkan rivers, we, we mean everything south of the, the Danube, what you see here. This is a map that represents the quality of the rivers, the, the integrity, if you like, the hydromorphological situation. Everything that is blue is natural or near natural. Green is still OK, and all the other colors are bad. Uh, red represent, uh, represents reservoirs here, impoundments. This is the situation uh, between Slovenia and Greece on the Balkans. That's the same uh, color mode of rivers in Germany. Um, the, the Austrian ones would look the same, the Swiss the same, and all this. It's, it would be rather typical. So you, the, you see they're all in a very bad, bad uh, condition. And about 92% of all German rivers don't, are not in a good ecological status. Again, so the difference. That's why we call it the blue heart of Europe. And that's a few rivers, just to give you an impression. That's Zermania, difficult to pronounce for me, you know, for in Croatia. <clears throat> that is that is easier for me. It's Trbanski Buk, a very famous waterfall in uh, in the Una River, and you can raft down there. Some of them jump down. It's ten or more meters down. I don't, wouldn't I wouldn't recommend. Uh, this is Neretva in uh, also in Bosnia. You s that's the striking thing here is the combination of old growth beach forest and the river. And this is kind of the queen, we call it the queen of the Balkans, uh, at least. It's uh, the Vyosa River in Albania. When I saw that river the first time in 2011, and I've seen a lot of rivers everywhere, I was not believing that this was still existing in Europe. Um, at, in this dimension, that's the Vyosa. Um, what we also did in the last 10 years, and actually we started with that, we assessed the fish species. So on the one end, the, which species are there? It's an enormous endemism. There are about 69 fish species only live in the Balkan rivers and nowhere else on the planet. Um, and one other factor is the, the diversity of trout species. While we mostly have brown trout and, and even more rainbow trout here um, with a very similar genetic information, the, the, the difference is in the Balkans is striking. When, whomever you ask from the scientists, uh, it's between four trout species and 21. It, it, it matters what you, what you consider a, 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 a species, I think. The bad side of it is it, um, that it's the, the whole river net, and we assessed so far 81,000 kilometers of rivers and streams, is at risk. 
every second year, every two years, we assess the dam projects, those under construction and those operating in that area. We're doing this since 2013. So for now, we have evidence of more than 3,200 dams that are projected. In autumn this year, 108 were under construction, mostly in Bosnia, Serbia, and in Albania. And there are, you know, 1,700 something operating. This is sounds a lot, it's if, but you compare it to the country we are actually now, Austria has more than 5,200 operating hydropowers, power plants. Germany has about 8,000. So that put into perspective, it's still an, an area with, uh, with a lot of free-flowing rivers. But that's, that's what most uh, dams that have been built and that are projected look like. They're so-called small-scale dams with less than 10 megawatt installed capacity. This is a, a dam built on Bosnian River by an Austrian hydropower company, a renowned one, the Kelak. And they say, we are the best ones. We build the state of the art. Uh, we, we built fish ladders. We have residual flow. This was a, um, a spawning river of the Danube salmon of the Huchen before. There's no way the Huchen can even get close to this ladder. And this ladder is for goats and not for, for fish even. Yeah. Drina River, it's um, between Serbia and uh, the Drina, Drina is built by Tara and Piva. And then it's Driva, it's the, the Huchen River number one in the world. So five out of six healthy Huchen rivers are on the Balkans. And the healthy one scientists consider with 100 or more kilometers of consecutive uh, Huchen populations. The Drina is the longest one. What we asked the scientists, what, what, what would happen if they built all those dams? What would that mean for the fish species? And don't look out to all the, the numbers, but look to the number 49. And they say that about 49 fish species would go extinct or would get close to extinction if all these dams would be built. And that equals about 10% of all European freshwater fish species. So in the name of you know producing green electricity, you know all these myths, things, um, we are risking an enormous amount of biodiversity loss. Just to bring, show you some more um, examples. This is actually one of my, maybe my favorite river. It's Neretva in Bosnia. That's what I'm, what I was try, trying to show you earlier. Look at the amount of forest and the density of the forest, and then this pristine upper Neretva. That's the upper Neretva part. That is without power, I think, in Europe. You have huge areas that look like the wilderness parts, and they are. But at the same time, the Neretva is the, the, the river basin that, as far as we know, is under attack the most. Even in Europe, there are 72 hydropower plants projected. Some are under construction, like this one, the Ulok uh, Dam, uh, close in the upper part also. Um, they, they, they're literally trying to kill that river for many ways, so they, they would try to make reservoirs instead of the, on the main river, divert all the tributaries, and in the lower segments, downstream of Mosta, you might know this bridge in Mosta, famous city, uh, they even divert the groundwater at a large scale from the river away. So they, they you know, it's like you want to drown someone, you shoot him and you hang him at the same time to make sure he's really dead, this river. And then knowing this river is extremely valuable, and, and, and from, the, uh, from the biodiversity perspective, for sure. So what we did is this year we had a science week there. We spent one week with about more than 50 or 60 scientists from, from the country, but a lot of international ones, Austria, Germany. And, and we had groups for fish. They, they were looking, for example, at the soft mouth trout. The soft mouth trout represents, for those you know, you know fish, no? They represent the, 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 the graylings. There's no graylings naturally in these Adriatic rivers, but these trouts, you know, replace them somehow. Um, we had some successes very briefly uh, this year. We, we are opposing all these dams. I didn't show all the strategies. We have a lot of lawyers. We finance 10 lawyers. We have the scientists. We have activists um, funding them. We have partners with the NGOs. And this year was uh, probably, after 10 years, the most, maybe, it's hard to say, uh, most valuable or successful one uh, by legal changes in the, 
and the Federation of Bosnia, you know, there's a complicated country, uh, we, we changed the law. So from now on, no new small hydropower plants are possible to, to be, get permits. They're out. So that killed with one shot 110 hydropower projects and 65 other ones are not completely unlikely, but unlikely. And in the other entity, uh, the Republika Srpska, they changed also the law and they deleted all the subsidies on small hydro. That was one of the drivers, the subsidies. You know, you can earn much more than the market price would actually uh, give you. In Northern Macedonia, seven dams were, were revoked uh, from a national park. The investors sued the government and there's still the court case is ongoing. Um, we also stopped the dam in the, we pushed the financiers out of the Bosna River in Bosnia. The, the KFW wanted to finance a, a dam that, that also they also rejected. And the, probably we, uh, the, one of the biggest successes was after 10 years of fighting for the Vyosa um, to stop 40 dams in the basin and in, have a wild river national park instead. We made substantial progress. Um, this is the river, uh, you know, that what I was saying, I didn't know and I didn't believe that these rivers really still exist on this continent in this dimension. It's 260 kilometers of free flowing, including a lot of tributaries. So we, in, in total, it's more than 700, maybe 900 kilometers even of rivers and stream that is still free flowing and connected and goes from the mountains in Greece into the Adriatic Sea in Albania. And so we're very close, and it seems that in February next year, Europe will have this, its first Wild River National Park. Wild River National Park is, a, is a, legally a, an IUCN Category 2 National Park, but we, we gave it the name Wild River because it's an absolutely river-related national park. So it's a, it's a skinny, skeleton-like uh, uh, structure with all the, all, all the tributaries, and that is important. We want the tributaries to be included we want the tributaries of the tributaries to the Riosa to be included. So get the whole river network. Right now we are, we are doing the mapping, the zoning, and going in, and, and then there is the discussion among the experts. Is it still, is it still belonging to this, <laughs> this catchment? You know, you're going to the details. So, but that's nice. And next year we will enlarge it, hopefully, also into Greece. And then we would, it would be the first river catchment, to my knowledge, that is as a whole, excluding a very few tributaries that are dammed, that would be excluded, would be protected as a national park. Inauguration, no. no. And I, uh, I believe, and I, we strongly would lobby for that, that the Vyosa is the first Wild River National Park, but not the last. So we need more candidates uh, for, for this strategy to protect rivers and give benefit to local communities which live along these little streams and rivers um, and we will come up with a list for the Balkans um, but it could be others as well and from a European EU perspective you know they have this green deal the biodiversity strategy with wonderful goals you know you stop biodiversity loss or, or, or at least minimize it until 2030 but they lack, from my perspective, the strategies, how to get there. We're all good in making promises into the future, but then this fucking future comes always closer and we don't know how to get there. You know, look at the Water Framework Directive. And, and we, we are convinced that this idea of a wild river national park that protects large, par large parts of a river basin, including the little ones and the little ones of the little ones, that's a nice strategy to, in order to fulfill these goals. So this is Neredvar again, that for, for sure would be, um, at least in, in large parts, uh, a candidate, or the Moracha here in Montenegro, together with the Skutari uh, Lake Scudder, the Skutari Lake, um, Tara Drina would be one for sure, Una, Unats. Uh, so there are candidates of long and, 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 and connected river systems still there, but if we don't act fast, as we do to, to, to we're kind of stopping the threat and at the same time offering solutions, um, we will lose them. The Balkan rivers is a gift to the earth, from my perspective, and they survived the decades of destruction miraculously for political reason, for, for lack of 
money in these periods where we destroyed everything. And now there's, we try to make them aware, also the decision makers there, that what they have is something unique. They should not follow our example to just damn everything. That's in the head of many. You are so rich because you destroyed the nature. So we want to destroy the nature to become rich as well. So, but the time has changed. We have different knowledge. There is all these things. And we try to offer that and convince them. We convince them also, and that's important, I want to like to say, not only by saying, oh, you could do a pr protected area and you get money. No, we convince them in a way that we close one door before. We make it impossible. We try, we try to make it impossible that they build the dams or divert the water for a irrig huge irrigation project. You have to close the door for most of them that they realize, oh, it would be really difficult to, 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 to uh, you know, fulfill my ideas. But there's another vision, this national park or protection. Then they go for it. So we, I think we need to tackle both, defend the rivers as much as possible, and then offer a solution. That's what we're doing on the Balkans. Thank you. Thank you so much, Uli. And um, let's see whether we can hear from the Blue Heart of Europe directly. Um, Jelena, Kirsi, do you copy? Yes, yes, you can. <laughs> Where uh -huh. are you? We are here at the river Komarnica, and I'm not sure if Uli, nice to meet you here again. Uh, mm -hmm. We are also on the Vyosa case, but, but um, yes, Komarnica river. Uh, behind us here, uh, behind Jelena, something like 500 meters from here, is the river Pukovica, which leads to the river Komarnica. And we are at the, let's say, last wild rivers of Europe, exactly. Um, look, uh, surrounded by small villages um, and, um, yes, small villages which could live so much better of uh, ecotourism, rural healthy development etc we already have that partly we are here um in the corridor of via dinarica if anybody has heard of that if not then just look it up via dinarica.com across the balkans uh, a, a major, yeah longer hiking cycling nature experience trail we are at the top uh, trail of cycling of montenegro uh, called endless landscapes and i'm gonna show you why that is called that way so Bukovica and then we come to the Voynik mountain which actually is absolutely next to the Komarnica river um, and um, we have some first successful eco villages also here and first rural households who could live very much better from um, from uh, sustainable and responsible tourism, rather than uh, <laughs> yeah, hoping for uh, bad jobs at the at the hydropower plant. So, so what are you what are you defending it from? What is this negative alternative that you refer to? Yeah. Well, look, um, uh, yeah, on top of hiking and cycling, I, I would mention also kayaking, wildlife conservation, tourism, horse riding. The Canyon Nevidio is the last conquered canyon of Europe, by the way. It's also here around the corner, uh, connected to Komarnica. So of such values, yes, we, we live in the United Nations decade of ecosystem restoration. And if, if, if we hear people saying we are not developed, no, that's wrong. We are preserved. And the only thing we need to do is to preserve what we have. And then, you know, uh, nicely uh, location, uh, local community based uh, to, to develop it further. We are defending this river from a huge hydropower plant, um, which has been in the books and keeps popping up like since 10 years. It will not be supported by the European Union. It is in the in the reports of the European Union. It will not be co-financed by European Union in any way. We are protecting this river and these villages from getting devastated. Uh, we have here in Montenegro 240 sunny days a year. So how about growing some solar solar power or on everybody's roof uh, to get the house warm and, and energy flowing? Uh, we are here also next to the UNESCO protected national park Durmitor and the nature park Drakisnica Komarnica. So 
enough reasons. And by the way, uh, also we had the big five mammals here in, in, in surrounding us. Um, we are protecting this nature's values, which need good cohabitation with the people. Mm. So is there something we can do as an international community, let's say, to, to help you to defend this, this absolutely stunning area around the Kormanitsa River? I will leave those words to Jelena here from Montenegro Ecology Society. I'm just a little consultant here, but she has the hard facts and figures and also the concrete plans and, and a pledge to everybody here who is listening to support us because we don't have Leonardo Caprio here yet, but maybe he would come. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, I just need to say from the point of view of biodiversity, we're talking about not only the river, but also canyon, which uh, is being built by this river since 30 million years ago. And here we have actually a, a complex mosaic of different ecosystems that are be are still being untouched, that are full of endemic uh, species. For example, the endemism of some plant communities goes up to 50% in some part of the Komarnica River. Uh, we also have endemic populations of fish and other species. Uh, from just uh, 192 uh, species of uh, daily day butterflies, we here have 126 which tells us a lot about the complex complexity of this place, which is actually a refugial place, a, a refugium where species have been hiding during the climat climatic crisis, like a uh, ice age, and from where they again started to... Um, uh, to, uh, to find their living to find space. Their living space again mm. throughout the Europe uh, after this climatic crisis passed. And we now know that we are on the... Uh, that another climatic uh, crisis has started. Uh, Komarnica is not well researched still. Uh, we know a lot about it, but we still don't know uh, enough because it's untouched it's it, you you cannot go there easily uh, so we uh, the support that we need is actually for the scientists to come uh, we have the plan to organize scientific camp here um, we have some two years maybe uh, left uh, of the space for the fight for this river since uh, until the next um, step of the government comes uh, so we have enough time uh, and I invite, invite everyone who wants to contribute not only scientists but also artists uh, tourism uh, experts economic experts energetic experts and so on to to come join us in our fight uh, and uh, give the contribution to the to saving Komarnica because um, Komarnica is actually protected uh, on the national level, recognized on the European level as important uh, site because it's a candidate for Emerald and Natura 2000 site, but it's also uh, recognized worldwide from UNESCO, uh, who suggested that Komarnica becomes part of the nat uh, Durmitor natural, natural Na heritage. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, uh, which means that it, it has its value globally. Um, uh, this is why uh, we are fighting for the river and um please come yes. and i also Concrete wanted to case, say no? i also, yeah. also wanted to mm -hmm. say that uh, i i spoke a bit just because we don't have enough time about the value of komarnica kirsi also thought, uh, talked about the value of this river uh, for the local people and i have to say that if we lose komarnica we won't only lose uh, forever because this is the canyon uh, these ecosystems here we will lose and uh, the opportunity for the development of the beautiful uh, uh, eco tourism in this region that is uh, that is based only on natural uh, untouched nature and the uh, things we are blessed yeah. uh, here mm -hmm, with. Mm -hmm. And there is also a concrete date of invitation. Uh, Yelena, yes. we are we are having here a camp in in springtime. Yes. So come and enjoy the the the, the river in springtime, um, at, and that'll be one of the really most beautiful parts of the year. Um, not the you know tourism peak season, but what is that camp about, uh, and when it, when will it be? The camp will be the end of April, beginning beginning of May. It will be. Five 
five days long. It will be scientific camp, but also networking camp. Uh, we will have activities to research the area, like um, like uh, 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 how do you say the uh, sportist ljudi koji hoće uh, uh, Also for like nature sportists, we have here fantastic yeah. kayaking opportunities. Nature, uh, just, yeah. And uh, it will be for everyone. There will be concert. There will be uh, stands where you can buy local food and so on. So it will be really beautiful and if you want to come just contact us it's not the first camp organized so believe it will be fun mm -hmm. yes, yeah and, and it will be, it's already it will be it's already marked in my calendar i think uh oh, right. you already got us um Thank you. at least i will be there and i think we'll hit the call and we'll support you as well as we can so Thank you so much, Kirsi and Jelena from the beautiful Komarnica. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. And Have a great best. day. See you here. Is there a question, Herman? Let's see. Are you still there? Oh, if there are questions, we... For Uli. Okay, it's fine. Thank you, Kirsi and Jelena. So. Uli, we got a question from uh, the chat box. And it says... Um, what is the business case for building small hydropower uh, uh, dams on Balkan rivers? How do we help create energy alternatives to these hydropower developments? Um, what is the business case? Well, <laughs> it's business as usual. Uh, in the end, it's to long story short, is uh, destroying nature and making money out of it. Uh, it's it's it came from the West, you know. For the West, uh, Central Europe, they built all the dams uh, wherever they could, and they suddenly for them a market opened up. You know, the the free flowing rivers for for hydro people, free flowing rivers is a chance. So they took the opportunity, and one of the driving forces was subsidies. And the, it started all in the early 2010, around 10, when the boom started on the Balkans. And that was purely driven by two things. The one was subsidies. So with your electricity bill, you pay an additional amount of money to support renewables. And the hydro lobby managed to get their old energy <laughs> into this, in this, in this category. So you funding, even if people who are protesting, blocking dams, projects, they're funding with their own bill the, 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 the boost of hydro. The second thing is corruption. Corruption in the Balkan is a traditional uh, way of, of dealing with things, and that made it for investors even easier to, to, you know, to get the permits. When somebody promises you will get the permit, and they say, ah, you have, but you have to do an EIA, an environmental impact assessment, usually say, okay, yeah, yeah, we will manage. So that was, the, the, this from my perspective and my understanding, the two driving uh, forces. And the alternatives um, is, I cannot repeat enough, it said it's save the energy. We all have no problem, actually, and honestly, no problem in producing energy. We are consuming too much. We are consuming way too much. Therefore, the answer cannot be to produce more. That would be the global, uh, the, the, the more higher level answer to that. Uh, the, the, the more detailed is one, you know, there's other renewables like solar, like uh, Kirsi was saying, Albania has, for example, 300 days of sun, and they did not have any solar power plant until recently. They're all focused on the, on the hydro. <laughs> Thanks, really great answer. Um, so next up, let's move to the northernmost parts of Europe uh, with Krista Borg from Sweden, who is the president of the a River Savers Association that kind of combines 53 member organizations in Sweden. And he will tell us what it took to keep some of the great northern free-flowing rivers flowing. Welcome, Christian, we're all ears. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me now. Is it okay? Perfect, yeah. You hear me? Yeah, okay, very good. Uh, thank you very much for uh, letting me uh, participate in this uh, very, very important uh, webinar. And... Uh, uh, I will tell you a little about our national rivers in Sweden. We have uh, four of them uh, that is stated uh, in the uh, Envir Environmental Act, actually. But um, uh, I will start with a little, little uh, background. Uh, River Savers Association, which I am actually Secretary General nowadays, not uh, President anymore. We have switched. 
So uh, it's an umbrella organization for groups against uh, hydropower exploitation. And we are we were formed in 1974. Uh, in Sweden, we have uh, 12,000 plus dams. Uh, and you see the, the map there. It's not actually the, the real dams, but it's the kind of distribution of dams in Sweden, you see. Um, uh, most often uh, they are abandoned or without operations nowadays, you know, old mill dams and, and uh, things like that. Uh, around 3,800 of the, those dams are connected to hydropower plants. Uh, we have 2,100 hydropower plants from the very, very smallest ones uh, with an installed uh, effect of less than 125 kilowatt and up to uh, about 208 of the big scale hydropower plants. And uh, as I said, we have four national rivers and, and they are uh, protected against hydropower exploitation. And all of them are up in the north of Sweden, uh, the, uh, the one third uh, land most north in Sweden. And why? So this is what I'm going to talk about now. Um, the big scale hydropower establishment, it started around 1909 in Sweden. Uh, and that was because Sweden tried to switch from a from an, uh, rural uh, farmer, industry, uh, farmer nation to, towards an industrial adjacent. Uh, and this went on. We had a new um, legislation in 1918, and then our parliament decided that every every stream should be exploited with hydropower because we needed electricity. Uh, and this was uh, not environmentally remarked until the 1960s. Actually, it was a small small mumbles in the 1950s, but until the 1960s, you can say it was without any bigger protests. Uh, and it all set off with the, the plans for Windel Elven, the Windel River, and that's about 700 kilometers north of Stockholm. Uh, and that was the kind of starting point for, for the more uh, organized resistance against uh, hydropower exploitation. Uh, the plans for the river uh, Windel was actually started in the, in the beginning of the 1960s. But in the spring of 1970, um, our prime minister said, no, you are not allowed to exploit that river. It should be uh, saved to the future as a natural river. And at that moment, local groups were founded everywhere else in Sweden to fight against other exploitation plans. So, to have a kind of umbrella organization for all those groups. In 1974, our organization, River Savers Association, or in Swedish, now we have a, 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 a small lecture how to pronounce this, Elvredarnas Sam Organisation, as it is pronounced in Swedish. We started in 1974 as an answer to this. And from that year uh, and until the end of the 1980s, uh, there was a kind of battle for our <coughs> remaining rivers, free flowing or not. Uh, and at the end of the 1980s, you can say that uh, most of the exploitation was finished in, in, in Sweden. Uh, and uh, our organization <coughs> was uh, participating in several of the governmental commissions over the same period of time, so to speak, as a part of these uh, commissions. Um, because we had the parliament in Sweden, they had a, a, a national exploitation plan, actually, uh, where they said that uh, hydropower should, to the uh, Swedish electrical grid, contribute with 66 terawatt hours of electrical energy. So uh, the trick was now to point out which rivers should be exploited and which, which rivers would be saved uh, for, for the future. And uh, one of my former colleagues in this organization, he had a very, very 
rough uh, uh, time to be in that group to point out which rivers to be exploited and which to save. And of course, as a river saver, it's not a funny thing to do, of course, but he was kind of forced because the government and the parliament had decided that way. Um, anyway, due to this, <clears throat> uh, there was a formal protection from hydropower exploitation in Sweden. Uh, and it started in the 1980s for those rivers that shouldn't be exploited. <clears throat> they instead, they set these um, form of protections. <clears throat> Sorry. And all this is nowadays formalized in our present uh, environmental act from the 1998. Um, uh, but already in 1992, the name National Rivers was stated in our parliament. So that's a, a, a name that um, most people in Sweden knows about. Uh, and there are, <coughs> sorry, uh, there are four rivers from the north uh, to south. It's Torne River, and that uh, is on the border of, to, of Finland. We have Kalix River, we have Peter River, and we have Vindel River. Uh, and every one of those are, uh, as I said, up in the north of Sweden. Very, very nice rivers, uh, especially Torne rivers is uh, really scenic too. So if you haven't been there, I urge you to go there and, and uh, just uh, stay there and watch it uh, or fish or, or do some canoeing or something. Uh, also, uh, several other rivers and stretches are also protected under the same paragraph in uh, the Environmental Act. So uh, we have a lot of rivers and small stretches in the south of Sweden that, that has the same protections. And now my conclusions before I stop. Uh, the plus or, or the pros. A prohibition for building HP plants or divert water for AP, uh, hydropower to other rivers. That's, of course, uh, very good. Um, and it's also good. It's not just biodiversity, also the values of scenic views and other parameters, uh, fishing science research uh, that are parameters why they uh, said they wanted to save those rivers. Uh, the cons, of course, the minus is um, we have exceptions, those hydropower plants that was already existing in this river before the protection, they are allowed to be there. And they are also, there are exceptions for them to refurbish when they have to do that. So uh, that's the thing that we struggle for in the Environmental Act, that when they have reached their lifespan, it should be removed instead of refurbished, of course, in a protected river. Um, and also, actually, a new hydropower plant is possible if proven environmentally safe. And those application processes, they are uh, open to legal frame of the full environmental act. That is OK. But this leads very often to legal, uh, legal pr procedures uh, of very long uh, duration. So we have two or three cases that has been in the, in the court for two or three decades now. And we still are fighting them. So we asked one week ago, we plead to the high court to uh, stop one of those uh, small hydroscale power plants. And also there is no protection in this river against other exploitation projects as mining or lodging, etc. And mining is a, is a question now in Sweden, because our politicians uh, will try to um, make Sweden the, the, the little China in Europe. So we have a lot of those uh, metals that are used for solar cells and wind turbines and like that. So, and there is no protection against that. So there is not a full protection. Okay, thank you very much for letting me tell you these uh, things. And um, if you have any questions, Thank you, Chrissy. I think we, we have to move on to keep on time, but um, yep. thanks so much for your time and good luck with the dark, cold Swedish winter up there. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so our next speaker is actually here live with us today, uh, Petra Ratnik, who is a, a member of the Slovenian Water Agency and chair of the um, Hydromorphology Task Group of the International Commission for the Protection of the Danube River. Um, do we have a mic for her? That'd be great.
Perfect. Welcome, Petra. Um, Thank you. So if you could just tell us quickly, what's the objective of the hydromorphology task group of the ICPDR? So um, as you know, the International Commission um, on the Protection of the Danube River consists of many national representatives that are working within working groups. And one of the working group is hydromorphology working group. And our working group is mainly responsible for, we say, significant water management issues that are related to the hydromorphology. And I think that it's the best shown on this picture. So what we are dealing it with, so we are mainly dealing with pressures related to hydromorphology. So on one hand, we are dealing with pressures related to hydrological regime. So like hydro picking, water abstraction, impoundments. Second group is um, dealing with uh, um, pressures related to longitudinal connectivity. So mainly with dams, weirs and so on. And the third group is, um, so the pressures related to morphology. So the altered morphological condition and especially also this connection of wetlands and flatlands. So this is one of the main activities that we are dealing with those pressures. And of course, in the next steps, we are looking also for then for the measures. And um, in the Danube River Basin, we are also trying to incorporate hydromorphological problematic into another integrative issues, like collaborating in the hydropower process, in the flood protection process, biodiversity process, and so on. So this is the main task. And also together with this uh, um, activity, we are also observing many different projects that are going on on the Danube River Basin and trying, of course, to incorporate the results of this project to our common river basin management plan. And, and what do you do for, for river connectivity specifically in the Danube catchment? Like, can you, can you break that down for us? Yes. So, as I said, I think that all, all these so issues ready. are very connected. So, yeah. maybe you can just show um, mm -hmm. to visualize the next slide. Yes. So, we did the Danube River Basin. We are trying to really um, make an overview on all these pressures so that are related to also to connectivity. So I would say that in this time, we are mainly connected to um, analyzing longitudinal connectivity, especially this connectivity of the hydrological regime of the sediment transport and so on. Um, and uh, on, the, on, the, on the other hand, we are to the lateral one. So this communication with the flat plains, with the wetlands. So this is exactly in this, on these um, maps, there are shown um, all those pressures that we are dealing with. And the next steps, of course, we are looking for the measures that are again addressing the connectivity. Maybe here I would just like to highlight that um, in the um, actual planning um, management plan, we also address as a significant management issue sediment transport. So also alteration of the sediment balance is now one of the crucial topics that, that is on the table. So, so you're taking a very holistic approach to this? Yes. Okay. So, and is there also talk already, because we often hear now these 25,000 kilometers of rivers that the EU wants to, to free up as part of the biodiversity strategy, or the, the EU restoration law. Um, does that already play a role in your thinking? For sure. Yes, for sure. Because um, we are somehow obliged then to find, together with all these Danube countries, what is, the step, what is the next step for this pressure? So this is the measure. And maybe if you go to the next slide, when I try to show. So we also then have a map where we will try to improve something. And all these measures that are related to hydrological regime, sediment, morphology, and so on, are also the measures that are directly addressing the river continuity. And because um, especially river continuity makes very important issue in the Danube in light of sturgeon problematic, we also have this sturgeon strategy where we want to address especially attention to this longitudinal conductivity. We also then further um, um, prepared a kind of a ecological prioritization approach. So where to start with um, removing uh, them so to make them passable so that also directly address these, these 25,000 kilometers. And on the next um, slide, you can also show. So this is the map of the Danube River Basin. And here are also um, shown the main, let's say, these pressures related to connectivity. And there was prepared in behind the ecological prioritization approach, so a kind of ranking of different barriers, weirs, and dams, so where this possibility is at most priority. And of course, it was recognized that the Iron Gate, is, uh, the, the dams on the Iron Gate, are the crucial one to establish the connectivity. And as Krista at the beginning said that they are working in the direction to make Rhine passable from Switzerland to North Sea. We are working to make Danube passable from Black Sea to the Schwarzwald in Germany. So this is something, and of course, because it was recognized like Iron Gate is a priority, 
ICPDR also started with additional projects. Um, these are the WIPES projects. So on the next slide, it's a bit more shown. So uh, the first project, WIPES, is specially oriented to this um, iron gate problematic. So how to make this iron gate passable? So there was a comprehensive study done, analyzed also, um, analyzed if this is technically feasible. And the result of the first WIPES project was yes. This is feasible, there are options to make it passable, also the iron gates. And now at the moment is also going on the second project, so the WIPES 2. And here the main aim is also to even make stronger studies on this possibility of the sturgeons and other species. And of course also to make the first design um, of the fish pass and also to estimate the cost. So I would say that ICBS here is somehow covered from very strategic one, like uh, on overview on the whole basin, but also coming to this connectivity with very exact proposal where to start that we will really can talk about the river connectivity. Um, and I'm curious, as a Slovenian citizen, do you have any idea what Slovenia could contribute to this goal of 25,000 kilometers? Uh, yes, so also in Slovenia, this is quite an issue. So how to address this 25? Um, maybe what I can say here is, um, that, yeah, two years ago we established a big inventory of all the dams and weirs, and we are still working on it. And based on this inventory, the next year also start a project when this prioritization of the dams were to start removing or to start make them passable with start. So I think this is one of the, one of the projects that will definitely contribute to this 25. And another one is more um, in relation flood protection and, um, let's say, hydromorphology. So in the past, um, when we are preparing these hydrologic and hydraulic studies for the sub basins, these studies were only oriented to the flood protection measures. So the only result was where we need to do the flood protection. What now we are doing yeah, for a second year is that we are broadening these studies so that they will not give the answer only to the flood protection, but also to the hydromorphology. So it means that we will define also the sections where we will preserve the rivers, the sections when the flood problematic is crucial and we have to do something, and the section when the river restoration is possible. And we are expecting that with these uh, transparent studies, then also we can support um, the idea of 25,000 kilometers. Amazing. Sounds like you do have a plan. And, uh, yes, we do have a plan. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for your time, yeah, Petra. Thank you too, too. And uh, keep up the good work. All right, so for our last guest before the coffee break, um, I'm happy to welcome Jurena Lorenzo, the European Program Manager at Odia Partners Wetlands International. Um, Jurena, thanks for, for making the time. Um, we would be curious thanks to, to you. <laughs> we would be hi. curious, hi, to, to learn a bit about the Dam Removal Europe Coalition from you. Does that sound good? Yes, it, it does. Perfect. So um, just to start, can you tell us what the mission is of the Dam Removal Europe Coalition? Well, the dam removal is uh, is a coalition. It's not a legal entity of uh, seven organizations that are working together to restore the free flow in the state of rivers and streams in Europe by establishing a mainstreaming barrier removal as a restoration uh, practice. And and just to tell you a little a little bit more about the coalition, it was established in 2015 and at the moment we are seven organizations part of the coalition and I would like to list them. They are World uh, Wildlife Fund, the Rivers Trust, the Nature Conservancy, the European Rivers Network, Rewilding Europe, Wetlands International Europe and World Fish Migration Foundation. Amazing, thank you so much. So so what about this, this restoration tool of dam removal is you know, makes it special. What what do you like about it personally as well? Well, about dam removal, uh, the the thing is that the river rivers in Europe are in very bad shape, and uh, they are infected by obsolete barriers that can lead to fragmentation, habitat loss, blocking sediment transport, or affecting water quality. And uh, dam removal is uh, it's it's a great way of restoring rivers because it can allow the river sediments to be transported downstream to coastal areas and this can help maintain 
healthy coastlines, uh, but it also protects, uh, it can protect us from uh, from storms or, or even from expected sea, sea uh, level rise. If you uh, remove a dam, you can also contribute to achieving the objectives of the Water Framework uh, Directive, or even you can contribute to achieving the, the European targets for free flowing rivers at 25,000 kilometers uh, that, that were mentioned uh, before. But not only, you can also, if you remove a barrier, you can do, uh, you are doing a one-time investment that permanently restores the natural stream functions of, of the rivers and, and habitats and can increase climate resilience. And something that is quite cool that I really like about that removal is that it's an investment. Uh, it's a very, it's, I would say that is the most cost effective investment that you can uh, make when restoring uh, a river uh, in opposition to, to retrofitting or upgrading the, the degraded uh, structure. And it can also create jobs and, and it can even foster the creation of a restoration economy. So besides the cost effective thing that I think that it's quite interesting and that we should research uh, more about it to convince uh, decision makers, policy makers, but also the general public about it. I really like that uh, when you remove a dam, you immediately see the benefits of it uh, through the appearance of, uh, for example, migratory species that were no longer there. So um, overall, it's a it's a it's a UL. It's a fantastic uh, tool that we really need to upscale as part of dam removal uh, Europe strategy. Amazing. And how how what is your approach? What is your strategy to upscale dam removal? Um, and also maybe what is the role of Wetlands International in this process? Yes, so Dam Removal Europe as a coalition has a strategy for the next decade, 2020-2030, to upscale Dam Removal Europe in, in, in Europe. And by upscaling, what we mean is uh, fostering or promoting actions that can be carried out by others to bring a greater impact. And this will be possible, of course, if we as a coalition stimulate these actions taken by others through our own actions and results. And the strategy of the coalition is to identify and prioritize river basins and dam removals that can maximize ecological and social uh, impact. We would like also to support the start of uh, projects on the ground. Uh, we would like to engage in targeted communications with our, uh, which are so important to provide a clearer picture of what dam removal is, and this can also help us engage better with uh, policymakers, uh, but also with the general public, and of course to advocate. Uh, we would like to advocate for the integration of dam removal into European and national policies, but also into legislation, finance systems, and very important into river basin management. Uh, plans And we would like to do this in partnership with other sectors, in partnership with users and practitioners. And that's, that is why it's also important that I mention that we would like to keep the network growing, uh, but we would like also the coalition to, to grow. And when it comes to Wetlands uh, International, for us, we believe that healthy rivers are essential solutions to solve the interlinked crisis of climate and biodiversity loss. So in our view, when, when a river is blocked, it's not healthy. And as part of Dam Removal Europe, our main aim is to strengthen the implementation and enforcement of freshwater related policies and legislation. That's what we mainly do and scale up solutions such as uh, barrier removals to achieve the free flow uh, target of the nature restoration law, but even exceed it. Then uh, in, uh, as part of the coalition, we also act in, uh, in Brussels as the voice for dam uh, removal uh, Europe. And we do so also be, by being part of another coalition that is called the uh, Living Rivers uh, Europe that advocates for the defense, the maintenance, and the improvement and implementation of the Water Framework Directive. And finally, we 
uh, as wetlands uh, at Wetlands International, we are also conscious that the biggest threat to the conservation of migratory freshwater fish in European rivers are often barriers that block the migration routes, the, what we call swingways. And we have seen in the free flowing rivers target of the nature restoration uh, law that, uh, but also in, in, in the European eel regulation and the water framework directive, that there is an opportunity for swingways there. And that is why we launched, uh, we launched recently the Trans-European Swingways Work Network which is the European realization of the Global Swingways Initiative to restore connectivity and address uh, conservation issues collaboratively. And uh, we would like to do this also as part of Land Removal Europe movement. Amazing, thank you so much. And just very briefly, can you give us a feel of the pulse of this movement? Where do you think is it going? Are you optimistic? Of course, I'm optimistic. I think that uh, the future is uh, bright and shines for dam removal in Europe. I really see it mainstream um, be with a bigger network, of course. Of course, and I also see the, the removal of barriers, not only coming from bottom up approaches, but coming also from top down uh, ones, thanks to, to newly integrated approaches. I think that being part of such a coalition is uh, something special because uh, we do this with uh, great passion. And I think that that can lead us to upscaling the, the dam removal in, in, in Europe. Amazing. Thank you, Jurena. Um, I don't know if there are any questions in the room um, or maybe, maybe on Slido or if we keep it at this and go for a coffee break. Cameron, you have something? One up. Thank you, Urena. You're welcome. Urena, are you still there? See, yes. Yeah, yeah. So we have here a, a Donald Duck, uh, Donald Duck from the Netherlands. Uh, it's 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 include. It's like two weeks ago. It's including a story about Donald Duck and his nephews removing a dam because they uh, they want to help these fish uh, passing the river. What do you think of these like awareness actions? Is it, is it essential uh, awareness on a, on a more European-wide level? It is indeed, yes, because this type of uh, communication tools or outreach, outreach tools are innovative, different, funny, and are addressed to kids and children. And so many times we, for well, and not only, because I, I really like this uh, Donald Duck uh comics i really love them so so yes i think that this is a great way of uh, showing to the world what dam removal europe is or not dam removal but europe but dam removal is and and learning about it because that's what we really want to do to make people understand that this is cheap effective and a great way of bringing our rivers back so i i really love that one the donald duck Amazing. We share that feeling. Thank you so much. And let's have a 20-minute coffee break. Thank you. See you soon.